Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I wasn't with you on Tuesday, so I hope you had a great holiday and remembered my advice last Thursday to not eat anything that I wouldn't eat or remember what I would say about what you're eating. So hopefully you're all still in a great healthy state and anxious to hear about some cool new stuff. All right, so it is well known that breastfed infants have better long-term health outcomes and reduced risk of many diseases, including breast cancer. African-American women are more likely to not breastfeed their infants and also to have a higher risk of triple negative breast cancer. We're going to call that TNBC from now on. Uh, this is cancer without receptors for estrogen, progesterone, or um, human epidermal growth factor. Uh, studies show that formula-fed African-American women have a higher risk of TNBC than those who are breastfed, which may mean that we could lower the risk of this more deadly breast cancer by just encouraging more breastfeeding in the African-American community. The Women's Circle of Health study included 786 African-American women with breast cancer and 1,015 controls. Data on reproductive history, pathology reports, breastfeeding were gathered and evaluated in relationship to estrogen receptor status and incidence of TNBC. Now, breastfeeding really didn't have a statistically um, meaningful difference with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, but it sure did have a, an influence on reducing the risk of TNBC. A new study, the results of which were presented at the Oncology Nursing 41st Annual Congress this year, uh, confirms this relationship. The study included 289 African-American women with a diagnosis of breast cancer. Again, they got the usual data concerning hormone-related risk factors, breastfeeding, pathology, pathology reports, etc. Lead researcher Julie Eggert reported that the data showed a clear relationship between lack of breastfeeding and increased incidence of TNBC in the women, and that increasing the practice of breastfeeding in the African-American community could lower incidence. Now, just to give you an idea, current breastfeeding rates in the African-American community are about 58.1%. They range from 73 to 83% in non-African-American communities in the United States. Now, here's a good reason why women should pay attention to this. Triple negative breast cancer represents between 10 and 20% of the invasive breast cancers that we diagnose every year. The incidence is three times higher in African-American women. In addition to ethnicity, younger age at diagnosis, more advanced disease, and higher grade tumors are common in women who have this particular variety of breast cancer. The prognosis is much poorer. Now, some other risk factors to keep in mind, in addition to breastfeeding, being overweight or obese are risk factors. Oral contraceptives increase the risk, and taking oral contraceptives for just one year is associated with a 2.5% or 2.5 fold increase in the risk of TNBC. The longer the oral contraceptives are taken, the higher the risk becomes. Now, the good news in all of this is that almost everything that I mentioned, except ethnicity, is a controllable factor. All women should be encouraged to breastfeed. Now, I support the right of Americans to make their own decisions on things. I don't think I should be the person or anybody else should be the person telling everybody else what to do. But I do think that women should have to sign a consent form outlining the benefits of breastfeeding and the risks of not doing it before they're allowed to buy formula. They still want to buy it, fine, but they should know the consequences before they do it. Um, the other thing is oral contraceptives. Same type of documents should be put in front of women before they agree to take birth control pills. It will be happy to prescribe them and give them to you, but you need to know these things and sign off that you understand and you want them anyway. I think we could reduce the demand for oral contra uh, contraceptives. And then you know, better eating, intervention programs, education programs to address better eating and exercise habits that would take care of some of the weight problem. So we can reduce all but one of the risk factors for TNBC, which is a deadly cancer. So easier to prevent than it is to cure some of these deadly cancers. Much better idea. And again, side effects of improving the diet is you reduce the risk of a whole lot of other things besides breast cancer that you don't want to get to. So Anyway, I love to talk about solvable problems. I wish I could say that all we have to do is talk about it. I put out the word, everybody acts on it. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way, but we can maybe hope someday that this will all make a difference as we get more and more people on board with this. 
All right. Here's a topic I get a lot of um, inquiries about, and so I thought I should probably just go on ahead and do an article and a video clip about it. And it concerns dandruff, all right? So dandruff is a condition in which white oily flakes of dead skin appear on the hair and on the shoulders, and it sometimes can also involve significant itching of the scalp. It's not contagious, it's not life-threatening, but it's aggravating and it's embarrassing. Uh, about half of the population will be affected at some point in time. Now, there's a particular type of dandruff called cradle cap that affects babies, usually newborns, and this isn't, it doesn't stay, stay around for very long. It usually resolves on its own without any intervention. So we're gonna go ahead and focus our attention on, on um, adolescent and adult dandruff. So let's first start with what happens when things are working right. Under normal circumstances, the scalp provides a protective barrier, maintains a well hydrated um, uh, condition, and it protects against pathogenic microorganisms. If that barrier is damaged, water is lost and microorganisms can invade. Low-grade inflammation can result and atypical epidermal proliferation can result. Isn't that a nice term for a dandruff? Atypical epidermal proliferation sounds like a real solid medical condition. All right, sebaceous glands and sweat glands cover the scalp, and sebum is produced by these sebaceous glands. It's comprised of several substances, including triglycerides and cholesterol. The amount of secretion changes throughout the life cycle, it peaks in adolescence, and then it declines as we get older. Um, sebum is an important food source for yeast, fungi, and bacteria. So dandruff happens when you have a combination of secretions from the sebaceous glands, interactions with the scalp microflora, and the presence of, presence of various fungi, we'll talk about the fungi first, then we'll get to the bacteria, like M. restricta and M. globos. Both of these fungi consume fat, particularly saturated fat for food, and where they get it is the saturated fat in the triglycerides. And then what's left is the unsaturated fat in the triglycerides, and this penetrates the scalp and contributes to this barrier disruption that leads to the whole cascade of events I described earlier, and you end up with dandruff. Now, M. restricta is also associated with other conditions of the skin, such as dermatitis, folliculitis, psoriasis, and the list goes on. Bacterial species are also found on the scalps of people with dandruff, the most common being, and I'm going to try to pronounce this right, Propionobacterium acnes and staph. All right. The severity of dandruff is largely dependent upon the combination of microbes. More good guys than bad guys, not so much dandruff. More bad guys than good guys, you get a lot more dandruff. Um, and, um, and the bacterial uh, uh, composition is at least as maybe more important than the fungi population. Um, propinium, uh, propinio, propionibacterium, how about that? You guys come up here and try to pronounce this stuff, right? Um, and staph have a reciprocal relationship. So um, the propinium bacteria secrete bactericides which suppress the growth of staph, and staph can inhibit the growth of the more beneficial bacteria. So a new study shows a higher concentration of the beneficial bacteria is protective against the development of um, dandruff. A high water content in the scalp is crucial and it creates a favorable environment for the growth of beneficial bacteria, not so favorable for staph. It can help to keep the staph in check. Now, what to do about dandruff if you have it, okay? And we'll get to the root causes of this in just a second here, but, but uh, shampoos like Head and Shoulders that can, contain um, uh, zinc perithium, uh, tar-based shampoos like Neutrogena, shampoos like um, uh, that contain silicic acid, uh, selenium sulfide like Selsun Blue, those are recommended for treatment. And they are effective for some people, but the problem is that if dry scalp is the problem, some of these shampoos are pretty harsh, they dry out the scalp more, and for many people, they make the condition they're trying to cure even, um, even worse. And so the instructions on the shampoos are use them every other day and then stop using them as soon as the dandruff goes away. A couple of other options I'll, I'll offer. Um, tea tree oil shampoo is much more natural. It doesn't lead to the dry scalp, and it works just as well, if not better, as some of the more commercial shampoos that everybody is familiar with. Interestingly enough, green tea formulas applied topically have been shown to be effective for a number of skin conditions like dermatitis and psoriasis, and research has shown that these same formulas can help with dandruff too. 
Now, if you don't want to get dandruff in the first place, several conditions contribute to um, an environment which is ripe for the development of dandruff. One is increasing, um, is dry skin. I mentioned that a couple of times. Another is irritated and oily skin. Hormonal fluctuations, not shampooing enough, reactions to shampoos and topical products, and inflammatory skin conditions that aggravate the scalp like psoriasis and eczema. Uh, some of these are affected by diet, like hormone production, psoriasis and eczema. And of course, some involve changing products that you apply and that sort of thing. But adopting a low-fat plant-based diet, because those are related to hormones and conditions like eczema, along with strategies like shampooing more often and using different personal care products if they're aggravating you, uh, can be helpful in preventing dandruff or reducing the risk of a recurrence. So um, just a, an overarching thing I'll say is that conditions of the skin like dandruff or psoriasis or eczema or acne is another example, they really are reflections of the overall health of the body. And there's no question that sometimes things reach a place where intervention is necessary, but the use of natural treatment combined with dietary change can usually do a good job of eliminating the problem so you don't have to keep worrying about it. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you on Tuesday with more news.